Sure. Um, yeah, ha thanks for having me here today. Um, as Andrew said, yesterday our State of the Climate report came out. Um, every two years we put out a report on, on climate change, essentially across um, BOM and CSIRO. Um, my section actually puts out climate reports um, every week, every month, every season and every year. So that's really reporting on climate variability, what has happened, describing what's happened and some analysis as well. Um, but every two years we also do this state of the climate report which is largely around the issue of climate change. So um, moving on, why, why this report? Um, really it's, a, it's about the change in atmospheric chemistry. So um, while we, re we will report on climate variability um, in a descriptive context um, every, every week, um, every, every couple of years we will come together to talk about um, what is, you know, a quite remarkable change in atmospheric chemistry. So this is reported on internationally um, by groups like the IPCC. It's very important in Australia that we have two agencies in BOM and CSIRO. They're actually synthesising the information for the local um, stakeholders and community and that's what we do. And, and this, this plot's basically showing why this report exists. So this is carbon dioxide um, concentrations in the atmosphere over the last 800,000 years and this natural variability is carbon dioxide actually responding to orbital changes in, in the Earth's orbital parameters um, which is glaciation and deglaciation, what most people know as ice ages and um, CO2 in the atmosphere responds to that. Um, it doesn't drive it, it responds to it. Um, in the last 200 years um, what we've seen is mechanical action driving CO2 up in the atmosphere. So. Um, as uh, Peter Heyman pointed out this morning, um, whether you're in the business of mitigation or adaptation, um, in a risk management framework, we need agencies reporting on what is going on here and what implications that has for the climate system now and, and going forward. So that, basically, I'm going to summarise this report through the slides that um, I'm going through. And just about every word um, that you see here is, is taken out of the report. It's a th synthesis report. It's probably errs on the conservative side. You need agreement across about 50 scientists across both organisations on the wording of this document. So um, I think it, it, it probably hits the right note in terms of reflecting the science. So this is what the this is what uh, so so what does that look like when we drill down in fine detail? And that's basically this is out of the report. And what we've got is increasing CO2. Um, it's nearly 400 parts per million. You have to go back 2.5 million years um, to an, an epoch known as the Pliocene. Um, to, to get atmospheric CO2 concentrations within that ballpark. When the Earth was about 2 to 3 degrees warmer, you had sea levels about 20, 20 metres higher, somewhere, somewhere in the order of 10 to 20 metres higher than today, at equilibrium once everything's pushed out. So how did we get this increase? Um, what we've got up here is the sources of CO2 going into the atmosphere. So most of it is actually from fossil fuel burning, and there's a small component due to land use changes, which is mostly land clearing which has actually tailed off largely due to changes in, in South America and Australia as well. Um, the atmosphere and the biosphere and the oceans and, and, and the sea ice and the cryosphere try to take as much of this out of the system as possible. So the CO2 emissions are a small fraction of the total variability of CO2 due to things like um, the biosphere in the northern hemisphere breathing out and breathing in over the seasons. Um, so um, about 30% um, of the additional CO2 into the atmosphere goes into the ocean and about 30% is taken up by growing forests and trees and elsewhere. That leaves about 40% that increases on a compounding basis in the atmosphere, um, so that has increased on a compounding basis in the atmosphere. And so that 40% is the thing that's changed atmospheric chemistry. Um, it's a good thing to acknowledge that no one has an intuitive understanding of what a 40% change in an atmospheric chemical constituent should do to the climate system. Um, you can have a very good intuitive understanding of the climate system at your local level. You can have a very good understanding of um, the cyclical nature of, of climate at your local level. Um, but no one has an intuitive understanding of what changes in atmospheric chemistry should do to the global climate system. I think that's a good starting point for the scientific basis of what we're talking about. And this rather complicated uh, figure over here basically shows how we know where that additional CO2 has come from. We basically check the carbon-13 to, to 14 isotope ratio and that tells us very, very clearly um, that the additional CO2 in the atmosphere has come from fossil fuel sources. And that's led through changes in the global climate system. So um, what we've done here is collect together basically all the main indicators that the climate system's warming up. Um, in the popular media there's often a focus on a thing called global mean temperature. 
Um, global mean temperature isn't used much in what they call detection attribution studies, so working out cause and effect. Um, typically, we look at multiple lines of evidence, and these are some of those multiple lines of evidence going through. Um, the troposphere, or, or the, the column of the atmosphere between the surface and the stratosphere, has warmed up. Um, it, we've got increased water vapour in, in that atmosphere as its holding capacity increases. Um, we've got a decrease, a net decrease in glacier volumes globally, um, a decrease particularly in Arctic um, sea ice extent, um, increased air temperature over the near surface, so about two metres above the surface, um, decreased polar ice sheets, so that's permanent glaciers on Antarctica and, and Greenland, um, increased air temperature over, over the oceans, marine air temperature, increased skin temperature, the sea surface temperature of the ocean, and these two are the biggies. So um, an increase in ocean heat content, that's a measure of heat in the, in the total ocean depth, so from the surface down to about 3,000 metres, um, and increase in sea level. So while you see some short-term volatilities in all these particular quantities, what we see in OHC and sea level is basically a monotonic or consistent rise in the amount of heat accumulated there. And about 90% of the additional energy from that 40% increase in CO2 is going into warming those oceans up. And at some point, that will pass a threshold where it greatly impacts on the atmosphere that sits above it. I'll move on now to, to what this means for Australia. So um, it's important to, to acknowledge that the attribution, so, so tagging these changes to greenhouse gases, has been done very, very thoroughly. Um, that knowledge flows through to the changes at the local level. Um, having done the attribution at the global scale, having looked at it in almost an epidemiological framework across different continents, um, you can very strongly attribute a lot of changes that you see over Australia to the same mechanism. There will be local micro changes that are, that are due to things like land use changes, stratospheric ozone changes impact on Australia, but it's the increase in greenhouse gases that causes the big signal among, amongst all that noise. So what's happened in Australia? So out of the report, um, Australia's climate has warmed. It's, it's warmed by about 0.9 of a degree overall. The warming has been greater at night than, than during the day. And that's actually a, a classic greenhouse gas signal, that, that when you warm up the night time more than the daytime, um, that's telling you that the atmosphere is retaining more moisture rather than the sun heating up. Um, and, and we've seen um, a change in our, our, our weather extremes, with our particular our temper, temperature extremes, um, with more extreme heat and, and less extreme cold. So this is the temperature trend across Australia. Uh, that's the temperature change from 1910. Um, the Bureau was formed in 1908, and um, while we had some good calibrated instruments around this part of the country, it wasn't until 1910 that we distributed standardised calibrated equipment across the whole country. Um, we have some reconstructions of temperatures going back to the mid-1880s um, through, through this region, but mostly we report from 1910. And as you can see, um, everywhere's warmed. Um, slight cooling in summer here due to increased rainfall, but otherwise all territories, all states in all seasons have warmed up. This is what that looks like as a time series. Um, so these are anomalies with respect to a climatological reference period from 61 to 90. And the red here is Australian near surface temperature. Um, and the green line there is sea surface temperature in the regions around Australia. So when people come and say, um, you know, your, your instruments over land are corrupted, um, that doesn't explain why we've had almost the exact change in, in temperature in the ocean surrounding Australia, the hemisphere and the globe in general. So basically the consistency check is not just this, that there's a whole lot of consistency checks, but what we're seeing is not a micro change, we're seeing a, a, a systematic change in the climate system itself. And so that's the mean warming. So what, what we know here is that we basically push the climate system by about one degree. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot, but um, when you average temperature over a large region, it's a little bit like taking your core body temperature. Um, a small shift in your bo core body temperature um, is much more significant than a change in the temperature of your earlobe, for example. So a change in the Australian average temperature or the global average temperature is much more significant than a degree change in the temperature of Canberra, for example. So that's what we're doing when we're collecting these large area averages together. And that small shift actually pushes the extremes quite a distance, and that's what I'll show next. So some people call this the hero graph out of the report. I'd never heard that term before, but apparently this is the one that most people latched onto. And um, so just to explain what this is, um, we're trying to take a measure off the spatial extent of the heat and the severity of the heat across the Australian continent. So um, we've got good daily data now, back to 1910. Um, and what we do is to create an all-Australian average each day. 
and then we select the top 1% of um, those, those daily anomalies per month, basically. So all these, um, all these bars here represent a count of the number of times the national daily temperature went into the top 1 percentile of heat um, um, instances around the country. Um, so what this has to collect is heat that is widespread across the continent and is quite exceptional, so up to 12 degrees above average in some instances. And what you can see here is quite clear. Um, from 1910 to 1941, we had about 28 days where the national temperature hit that top percentile. Um, in 2013, we had 28 days that hit that top percentile. And you can see 2009, 2005, these were all um, record years, basically. And um, the incidence of heat, the frequency of heat, the spread in, in the extent of that heat, and the intensity of the heat is increasing. And we see that in the heat wave statistics as well. The heat waves are becoming longer, the, the central intensity of them are higher, and their frequency is higher as well. So this is kind of collected together in this graphic as well. Rob um, Vitesi, our director, showed this graph earlier today. I'm just going to show it in the context of what we've just shown. Um, why do we get that large shift in extremes? So these are temperature bell curves, or normal distributions, um, from um, 104 stations distributed across Australia, where we have very good records for. <coughs> and we've binned this into three epochs. So we've got um, 1951 to 80, um, 19, I think that's 81 to 2010, and then a period that's um, the last 15 years, 1999 to 2003. So this drift to the right is a heating up of temperatures. And the main shift is actually all this binning here. So that's the same old warm weather from the 1950s, but just much more of it. Um, but what we've got here is um, a two standard deviations, which is um, what we're calling extremely warm months. And you can see that months that occurred around 2% of the time in the 1950s through the mid-century are now occurring about 10% of the time. So that's a five-fold increase in, in, in hot months. And we've got about a third decline in cold months over that time. So that's that nudge to the distribution that actually pushes you into extremes. This is the, the sort of the proof of climate change. Unfortunately, what we feel is weather out here. So you'll talk to a lot of people that are expecting to see temperatures they've never seen before as proof of climate change. With a 40% increase in, in CO2, you're more concentrating on this shift in distribution. And Rob also showed this plot, and that's 2013. It was Australia's warmest year on record. What we've plotted here is the daily temperature anomaly for the month um, compared to, to 1961 to 90. And this is actually a really extraordinary plot. Mostly, um, for most years, you'd expect to see a mix of cool and warm conditions. But what we had in 2013 um, was a sequence of, of heat waves in summer and what we call mild waves or warm waves during winter. And these were really quite extensive. You can see um, how, how much of the continent they affected. And really, it's this absence of cold weather that's really very remarkable. Um, when we talk about that shifting distribution, it's not just that hot end. It's this complete absence of, of intervening cold outbreaks, particularly over the southern parts of the continent, that are really notable. And again, harking back to Peter Heyman's talk, for those that saw it this morning, um, the absolute impact of this in terms of the duration and intensity of heat wave has large implications for human health and, and infrastructure, but it's the timing of these events that makes a huge impact on agriculture. So um, a heat wave in spring can knock you know, 10 to 15% off a yield. Um, you get it at the wrong time in occurrence with frost, and then you have really big issues as well. So in terms of phenology and other seasonality issues, um, this year is one um, that, that we should just that I'll keep in your mind as we go through the talk. The report also cover rainfall changes. Um, somewhere in the public psyche, rainfall uh, drought got associated with climate change. Actually, when you look at the climate models run since 1990, um, a warmer atmosphere means more moisture in the atmosphere and more rainfall. Um, it also means more evaporation, and that translates to wet areas getting wetter and dry areas getting drier. And that's actually kind of what we've seen in Australia. Um, I've got a question mark here for this point, that rainfall average across Australia has slightly increased since 1900, um, with the largest increase since 1970. And that question mark is just due to that large background variability in Australian rainfall. It makes it hard to discern trends over time. But we have discerned some changes, and that's what we're here to talk about. So this is a map of um, um, summer, summer temperature deciles. So blue here is um, very much above average to highest on record since 95, 96, over that summer monsoon period, April to October. And it's rainfall through here during these months that's largely responsible for that increase in Australian temperature, uh, Australian rainfall. 
And I've drawn this map, oh, sorry, I've, I've put a satellite map here. This is actually a satellite picture of an active monsoon. So we've got these tropical systems bringing rainfall. So typically all the weather is coming from above that red line during this time of the year. It's not really originating down south. And it's weather from these tropical systems that's increased the overall rainfall in Australia. But amid that background of variability, um, whether this is a pattern that will continue into the future, even the models aren't, aren't quite clear on that one. What's um, probably more certain in the data <coughs> is a drying trend across the south. So um, particularly in the southwest of WA, rainfall since 1970 um, has undergone a step change. And it's mostly in winter. That's when they get most of their rainfall. Um, and it's a step change of about 10 to 20 percent reduction in that rainfall. And we've seen that across in the southeast um, since about 1990. Um, we've got early, late autumn and early winter rainfall, again about a 15 percent decline um, in, at that time of year. <coughs> and this is a picture of, of that rainfall decline. So again, what I've got here is a rainfall decile map. Um, red on this one is, is lowest on record or very much below average in orange. And now we're talking about rainfall that's coming from these cutoff lows and cold fronts that sweep across the continent during the cooler months of the year. And what you can see here for the southwest is actually the rainfall here in winter was some of the most reliable wintertime rainfall in the, con um, in the whole continent. And actually, if you go out there and look at the ecology, it's very similar to Mount Nash, the Marion Carey forests. Um, so there was obviously a high rainfall regime over this um, area of the continent for a very, very long period of time. Um, I've gone down into the limestone casts in this region, which are the underground caves, and you can actually see um, the high water mark somewhere around your head. So you can see both a loss of um, the very wet winters and a reduction in rainfall there. And that temperature and rainfall change is translated through to more fire weather. So I'll quickly touch on this in, in the time I've got left. Um, these big circles here are increases in both the cumulative fire danger index and the extreme fire danger index. So it's a forest fire danger index. And what we've seen is the top percentiles of that fire weather is becoming more extreme, and the fire weather is pushing into autumn and spring. So we've got a, a longer fire season. That's Melbourne Airport. So I'm going to take liberty to just take a few more seconds. Melbourne Airport's in a great location for fire activity in the southeast. And you can see the influence of the millennium drought there and the two years of rainfall. But this signal is, is independent of that rainfall variability. It's, it's driven by the temperature change. So quickly um, finishing up, these are projections for Australia. Um, what we've got here is around the country, um, um, basically northern Australian rainfall, quite uncertain. But southern Australia, a projection of the continued drying. In fact, it's a part of the world where the models really closely agree on rainfall declines, particularly in the southwest, which means increased frequency and severity of drought more extreme fire weather, a prolonged fire season, higher sea levels and ocean acidification. So I've got a way I'll show this um, to, to audiences because I think projections don't mean much at all. So what I do is I take a thought experiment, which is um, there's, a there's, a, there's a landscape analogue out there for the climate change that your region is going to experience, and there's probably someone using that land quite productively right now. So um, if I take a location in central, Mel uh, central Victoria, so the Yarra Valley, there's the Yarra Valley in drought and in good times. And I make it two degrees warmer or 20% drier. I shift it somewhere into the Wimmera Mallee. This is Horsham during drought and, and good times. And you can see it's a very different climatology. And this is the way climate change would be expected to move across the landscape. I can do that again by taking um, more marginal country. So it's starting in Horsham and then taking that 20% drier and about two degrees warmer. And you're now talking about the central Darling, and that's really quite a different location again. The problem is that this is going to occur simultaneously across the whole continent. So my last slide is the one that Rob showed. Um, and it doesn't show up that well on this. But what I've got here is um, about 28 different climate models forced with greenhouse gases only um, from around the world for Australian annual temperature. And that white line you can just see there is the actual observed temperature. What we had in 2013 was the warmest year on record. It's, um, continental wide heat, as discussed earlier. So in terms of that implication going forward, by about 2030, that record warm year sits in the mid of the distribution, so it's about an average year. And then sometime by the end of the century, that becomes a really unusually cold year. So in terms of adaptation, you can probably wait a bit to adapt. You've got to see the lie of the land. You've got to see what's happening. There are adaptation measures, 
But I guess this is the global mitigation problem. Um, can you adapt to what's going to happen at this end of the spectrum? Thank you.